Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lulu, Sarah, and Chloe. And we have a new kitty named Bella, but she's nervous and scared and she's getting all... She's getting in her safe place right now. But anyway, uh, this week we're going to get back into Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, And we're on chapter... Well... As always, I want to please remind you to stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and let's get there. Okay, let's get into... Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. We are on. I'm going to read several chapters because, like I said, chapters are short. Okay. We're in chapter 19. That's a short chapter. Missy Dandridge kept Gage while Rachel ran Winston Churchill to the vet's office. That night, Ellie stayed home, stayed awake until after, hi, honey, after 11, complaining querulously that she couldn't sleep without church and calling for glass after glass of water. Finally, Lewis refused to let her have any more on the grounds that she would wet the bed. This caused a crying tantrum of such ferocity that Rachel and Lewis stared at each other blankly, eyebrows raised. She's scared for church, Rachel said. Let, let her work it out, Lou. She can't keep it up at that pitch for long, Lewis said. Lewis said. I hope he was right. Lou, Ellie's hoarse, angry cries became hitches and hiccups and moans. Finally, there was silence. When Lewis went up to check on her, he found she was sleeping on the floor with her arms wrapped tightly around the cat bed that Church hardly ever deigned to sleep in. <laughs> he removed it from her arms, put her back in bed, brushed her hair back from her sweaty brow gently and kissed her. On impulse, he went into the small room that served as Rachel's office, wrote a quick note in large black letters on a sheet of paper, I'll be back tomorrow, love Church and pinned it to the cushion on the bottom of the cat bed. Then he went into his bedroom, looking for Rachel. Rachel was there. They made love and fell asleep in each other's arms. Church returned home on the Friday of Lewis's first full week of work. Ellie made much of him. He used part of her allowance to buy him a box of cat treats and nearly slapped Gage once for trying to touch him. This made Gage cry in a way mere parental discipline could never have done. Receiving a rebuke from Ellie was like receiving a rebuke from God. Looking at Church made Lewis feel sad. It was ridiculous, but that didn't change the emotion. There was no sign of Church's former feistiness. No more did he walk like a gunslinger. Now his walk was the slow, careful walk of the convalescent. He allowed Ellie to hand feed him. He showed no signs of wanting to go outside, not even to the garage. He had changed. Perhaps it was ultimately for the better that he had changed. Neither Rachel nor Ellie seemed to notice. See, end of chapter 19 to chapter 20. Chapter 20. Indian summer came and went. Brazen color came into the trees, rioted br briefly, and then faded. After one cold, driving rain in mid-October, the leaves started to fall. Ellie began to arrive home laden with Halloween decorations she had made at school and entertained Gage with the story of the headless horseman. Gage spent that evening babbling happily about somebody named Itchy Bod Brain. <laughs> Rachel got giggling and couldn't stop. It was a good time for them that early autumn. Lewis's work at the university had settled into a demanding but pleasant routine. He saw patients. He attended meetings of the Council of Colleges. He wrote the obligatory letters to the student newspaper advising the university to University's co-ed co population of the confidentiality of the infirmary's treatment for VD and extorting the student population to get flu boosters, as the A-type was apt to be prevalent again that winter. He sat, he sat on panels. He chaired panels during the second week in October. He went to the New England Conference on College and University Medicine in Providence and presented a paper on the legal ramifications of student treatment. Victor Pascal was mentioned in his paper under the fictitious name of Henry Montez. The paper was well received, began working up the infirmary budget for the next academic year. 
His evenings fell into a routine. Kids after supper, a beer or two after Judd Crandall. Sometimes Rachel came over with him if Missy was available to sit for an hour. And sometimes Norma joined them, but mostly it was just Lewis and Judd. Lewis found the old man as comfortable as an old slipper. And he was... And he would talk about Ludlow history going back 300 years almost as though he had lived all of it. He talked but never rambled. He never bored Lewis, although he had seen Rachel yawning under her hand on more than one occasion. He would cross the road to his house again before 10 on most evenings, and like an, as not, he and Rachel would make love. Never since the first year of their marriage had they made love so often, and never so successfully and pleasurably. Rachel said she believed it was something in the artesian well water. Lewis opted for the main air. The nasty death of Victor Pascal on the first day of the fall semester began to fade in the memory of the student body and in Lewis's own. own. Pascal's family no doubt still grieved. Lewis had spoken to the tearful, malicious, excuse me, tearful, mercifully faceless voice of, Vic, of Pascal's father on the telephone. The father had only wanted the assurance that Lewis had done everything he could, and Lewis had assured him that everyone involved had. He did not tell him of the confusion, the spreading stain on the carpet, and how his son had been dead almost from instant the instant he was brought in. Although there were things that Lewis, these were things that Lewis thought he himself would never forget. But for those to whom Pasco was only a casualty, he, he, had, he had already dimmed. She's funny. Lewis still remembered the dream and the sleepwalking incident that had accompanied it, but it now seemed almost as if it had happened to someone else or on a television show he had once watched. His one visit to a whore in Chicago six years ago seemed like that now. They were equally unimportant. Side trips which held a false resonance, like sounds pr produced in an echo chamber. He did not think at all about the dying pa Pasco but what the dying Pasco had or had not said. There was a f hard frost on Halloween night. Lewis and Ellie began at the Crandalls. Ellie cackled satisfyingly, pretended to, ri pretended to ride her broom around Norma's kitchen, and was duly pronounced, just the cutest thing I ever saw, isn't she, Judd? Judd agreed that she was and lit a cigarette. Where's Gage, Lewis? Thought you'd have, you'd have him dressed up, too. They indeed planted... On taking Gage around, Rachel in particular had been looking forward to it because she and Missy Dandridge had whomped together a sort of big bug costume with twisted coat hangers wrapped in crepe paper for feelers. But Gage had come down with a troublesome bronchial cold and after listening to his lungs, which sounded a bit rattly, and consulting the thermometer outside the window, which read only 40 degrees at 6 o'clock, Lewis had nixed it. Rachel, although disappointed, had agreed. Ellie had promised to give Gage some of her candy, but the exaggerated quality of her sorrow made Lewis wonder if she wasn't just a bit glad that Gage would, wouldn't be along to slow her down or steal part of the limelight. Poor Gage, she said. She had said in tones usually reserved for those suffering terminal illness. Gage, unaware of what he was missing, sat on the sofa watching Zoom with Church snoozing beside him. Ellie, which <coughs> Gage had replied without a great deal of interest and went back to the TV. Poor Gage, Ellie had said again, fetching another sigh. Lewis thought of crocodile tears and grinned. Ellie grabbed the hand, grabbed his hand and started pulling pulling him. Let's go, Daddy, let's go, let's go, let's go. Gage had has got a touch of the croup, Lewis said to Judd now. Well, that's a real shame, Norma said, but it will mean more to him next year. Hold out your bag, Ellie. Whoops. She had taken an apple and a bite sized snicker bar out of the treat bowl on the table. But both of them had fallen out of her hand. Lewis was a little shocked at how claw-like that hand looked. He bent over and picked up the apple as it rolled across the floor. Jug got the Snickers and dropped it into Ellie's bag. Oh, let me get you another apple, honey, Norma said. That one will bruise. It's fine, Lewis said, trying to drop it into Ellie's bag. But Ellie stepped away, holding her bag protectively shut. I don't want a bruised apple, Daddy, she said, looking at her father, as if he might have gone mad. Brown spots, yuck. Ellie, that's damned impolite. Don't scold her for telling the truth, Lewis, Norma said. Only children tell the whole truth, you know. That's what makes them children. The brown spots are yucky. Thank you, Mrs. Crandall, Ellie said, casting a vindicated eye on her father. You're very welcome, honey, Norma said. Judd escorted them out on the, out to the porch. Two little ghosts were coming up the walk, and Ellie recognized them both as friends from school. She 
took them back to the kitchen, and for a moment Judd and Lewis were alone on the porch. Her arthritis has gotten worse, Lewis said. Judd nodded and pinched out his cigarette over an ashtray. Yeah, it's come down harder on her every fall and winter, but this is the worst it's ever been. What does her doctor say? Nothing. He can't say nothing because Norma hasn't been back to see him. What? Why not? Judd looked at Lewis, and in the light cast by the headlamps of the station wagon waiting for the ghosts, he looked oddly defenseless. I'd meant to ask you this at a better time, Lewis, but I guess there isn't no good time to impose on a friendship. Would you examine her? From the kitchen, Lewis could hear the two ghosts booing and Ellie going into her cackles, which she had been practicing all week again. It all sounded very fine and Halloweenish. What else is wrong with Norma, he asked. Is she afraid of something else, Judd? She's been having pains in her chest, Judd said in a low voice. She won't go see Dr. Weybridge anymore. I'm a little worried. Is Norma worried? Judd hesitated and then said, I think she's scared. I think that's why she doesn't want to go to the doctor. One of her oldest friends, Betty Kosla, died in the EMMC just last month. Cancer. She and Norma were of an age. She's scared. I'd be happy to examine her, Lewis said. No problem at all. Thanks, Lewis, Judd said gratefully. If we catch her one night, gang up on her, I think. Judd broke off, head cocking quizzically to one side. His eyes met Lewis's. Lewis couldn't remember later exactly how one emotion slipped into the next. Try <laughs> Trying to analyze it only made him feel dizzy. All he could remember for sure was that curiosity changed swiftly into a feeling that Somewhere something had gone badly wrong. His eyes met Judd's, both unguarded. It was a moment before he could find a way to act. Hoo-hoo, the Halloween ghosts in the kitchen chanted. Hoo-hoo. And then suddenly the huh sound was gone and the cry rose louder, genuinely frightening. Ooh, and then one of the ghosts began to scream. Daddy, Ellie's voice was wild and tight with alarm. Daddy, Mrs. Mrs. Crandall fell down. Ah, Jesus, Judd almost moaned. Ellie came running out under the porch, her black dress flapping. She clutched her broom in one hand. Her green face now pulled long in dismay. It looked like the face of a pygmy wino in the last stages of alcohol poisoning. The two little ghosts followed her, crying. Judd lunged through the door, amazingly spry for a man of over eighty. No more than spry, again almost lithe. He was calling his wife's name. Lewis bent and put his hands on Ellie's shoulders. Stay right there. Here on the porch, Ellie, understand? Daddy, I'm scared, she whispered. The two ghosts barreled past them and ran down the walk, candy bags rattling, screaming their mother's name. Lewis ran down the front hall and into the kitchen, ignoring Ellie, who was calling for him to come back. Norma lay on, this, on the hilly linoleum by the table and litter of apples and small Snickers bars. Apparently she had caught the bowl with her hand going down and had overturned it. Lay nearby, like a small Pyrex flying saucer, Judd was chafing one of her wrists, and he looked up at Lewis and with a strained face. Help me, Lewis, he said. Help Norma. She's dying, I think. Move to one side, Lewis said. He kneeled and came down on a spy, crushing it. He felt juice bleed through the knee of his old cords, and the cidery smell of apples suddenly filled the kitchen. Here it is, Pasco, all over again, Lewis thought, and then shoved the thought of his out of his mind so fast that it might have been on wheels. He felt for her pulse and got something that was weak, thready, and rapid, but not really a beat, but only simple spasms, extreme arrhythmia, well on the way to full cardiac arrest. You and Elvis Presley, Norma, he thought. He opened her dress, exposing a creamy yellow silk slip, moving with his own rhythm, rhythm now. He turned her head to one side and began administering CPR. Just, Judd, listen to me, he said. Heel of the left hand, one-third of the way up, the breastbone four centimeters above the xiphoid process, right hand gripping the left wrist, bracing, lending pressure, keep it firm, but let's take it easy on the old ribs, no need to panic yet, and for Christ's sake, don't collapse the old lungs. She's funny as heck. I'm here, Judd said. Take Ellie, he said. Go across the street carefully. Don't get hit by a car. Tell Rachel what happened. Tell her I want my bag, not the one in the study, but the one on the high shelf. In the upstairs bathroom, she'll know the one. Tell her to call Bangor MedQ and to send an ambulance. Bucksport's closer, Judd said. Bangor's faster. Don't you call. Let Rachel do that. I need that bag. And once she knows the situation here, Lewis thought, I don't think she'll bring it over. 
Judd went. Lewis uh, heard the screen door bang. He was alone with Norma Crandall and the smell of apples. From the living room came the steady tick of the seven-day clock. Norma suddenly uttered a long, snoring breath. Her eyelids fluttered, and Lewis was suddenly doused with a cold, horrid certainty. She's going to open her eyes. Oh, Christ, she's going to open her eyes and start talking about the pet cemetery. But she only looked at Lewis with a muddled sort of recognition, and her eyes closed again. Lewis was ashamed of himself and his stupid fear that was so unlike him. At the same time, he felt hope and relief. There had been some pain in her eyes, but not agony. Her first guess was... His first guess was that this had not been a grave seizure. Lee, Lewis was breathing hard now and sweating. No one but TV paramedics could make CPR look easy. A good steady cl closed chest massage popped a lot of calories, and the webbing between his arms and shoulders would ache tomorrow. Can I do anything? He looked around. A woman dressed in slacks and brown sweater stood hesitatingly in the doorway, one hand clutched into a fist between her breasts, the mother of the ghosts, Lewis thought. No, he said, and then said, Yes, wet a cloth, please, wring it out, put it on her forehead. She moved to do it. Lewis looked down. Norma's eyes were open again. Lewis, I fell down, she whispered. Think I fainted. You've had some sort of coronary event, Lewis said. Doesn't look too serious. Now relax and don't talk, Norma. He rested for a moment and then took her pulse again. The beat was too fast. She was morse coding. Her heart could, would beat regularly, then run briefly in a series of beats that was almost but not quite fibrilla fibrillation, and then began to beat regularly again. Beat, 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 whack, whack, whack. Beat, 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 beat. It was not good, but it was marginally better than a cardiac arrhythmia. The woman came over with the cloth and put it on Norma's forehead. She stepped away uncertainly. Judd came back in with Lewis's bag. Lewis, she's going to be fine, Lewis said, looking at Judd, but actually speaking to Norma. Meg Q coming? Your wife is calling them, Judd said. I didn't stay around. No hospital, Norma whispered. Yes, hospital, Lewis said. Five days observation, medication, then home with your feet up, Norma, my girl. And if you say anything else, I'll make you eat all these apples, cores and all, she smiled wanly, then closed her eyes again. Lewis opened her his bag, rummaged, found the isodil, or I think that's how it said, and shook one of the pills so tiny it easily would have fit on the moon of one fingernail into the palm of one hand. He recapped the bottle and pitched the pill between his fingers. Norma, can you hear me? Yes. Want you to open your mouth. You did your trick. Now you get your treat. I'm going to put a pill under your tongue, just a small one. I want you to hold it there until it dissolves. It's going to taste a little bitter, but never mind that, all right? She opened her mouth, stale denture breath, waked it out, and Lewis felt a moment of aching sorrow for her, lying here on her kitchen floor in a litter of apples and Halloween candy. It occurred to him that once she had been seventeen, her breasts eyed with great interests by the young men of the neighborhood, all her teeth her own, and the heart under her shirtwaist, a tough little pony engine. She settled her tongue over the pill and grimaced a little. The pill tasted a little bitter all right. It always did, but she was no Victor Pascal, beyond help and beyond reach. He thought Norma was going to live to fight another day. Her hand groped in the air, and Judd took it gently. Lewis got up then, found the overturned bowl, and began to pick up the treats. The woman who introduced herself as Mrs. Budinger from down the road helped him, and then said she had thought she had better go back to the car. Her two boys were frightened. Thank you for your help, Mrs. Budinger. Lewis said. I didn't do anything, she said flatly, but I'll go down on my knees tonight and thank God you were here, Miss Dr. Creeb. Lewis waved a hand, embarrassed. That goes for me, too, Judd said. His eyes found Lewis's and held them. They were steady. He was in control again. His, his brief moment of confusion and fear had passed. I owe you one, Lewis. Get off it, Lewis said, and tipped a finger toward Mrs. Budinger as she left. She smiled and waved back. Lewis found an apple and began to eat it. The spy was so sweet that Lewis's taste buds cramped momentarily, but that was not a totally unpleasurable unple sensation. One, one tonight, Louis thought, and worked on the apple with relish. He was ravenous. I do, though, Judd said. When you need a favor, Lewis, you see me first. All right, Lewis said. I'll do that. The ambulance from Bangor and Medcue arrived tw 20 minutes later. As Lewis stood... Outside watching the orderlies load Norma into the back, he saw Rachel looking out the living room window. He waved to her. She lifted a hand in return. He and Judge stood together and watched the ambulance pull away, lights flashing, sirens 
silent. Guess I'll go on up to the hospital now, Judd said. They won't let you in. You just you see her tonight, Judd. They'll want to run an EKG on her and then put her in intensive care. No visitors for the first 12 hours. She going to be okay, Lewis? Really okay? Lewis shrugged. No one can guarantee that. It was a heart attack. For whatever it's worse, I think she's going to be fine, maybe better than ever, once she gets on some medication. Aya, Judd said, lightening a Chesterfield. Lewis smiled and glanced at his watch. He was amazed as he was only ten minutes to eight. It seemed that a great deal more time had gone by. Judd, I want to go get Ellie so she can finish her trick-or-treating. Yeah, of course you do. This came out as, cost you do. Tell her to get all the treats she can, Lewis. I will, Lewis promised. Ellie was still in her witch costume when Lewis got home. Rachel would try to persuade her into her nightie, but Ellie had resisted, holding up with the possibility that the game, suspended because of heart attack, might yet be played out. When Lewis told her to put her coat back on, Ellie whooped and clapped. It's going to be awfully late for her, Lewis. We'll take the cat car, he said. Come on, Rachel. She's been looking forward to this for a month. Well, she smiled. Ellie saw it and shouted again. She ran to the coat closet. Is Norma all right? I think so. He felt good, tired, but good. It was a small one. She's going to have to be careful, but when you're 75, you have to recognize that your pole vaulting days are done anyway. It's lucky you were there, almost God's providence. I'll settle for that luck, he pro grinned as Ellie came back. You ready, Witch Hazel? I'm ready, she said. Come on, come on, come on. On the way home with the half a bag of candy an hour later, Ellie protested when Lewis finally called the hall, but not too much. She was tired. His daughter startled him by saying, Did I make Mrs. Crandall have the heart attack, Daddy, when I wouldn't take the apple with the bruise on it? Lewis looked at her startled, wondering where children got such funny, half-superstitious ideas. Step on a crack, break your mother's back. Loves me, loves me not. Daddy's stomach, daddy's head. Smile at midnight, daddy's dead. That made him think of the pet cemetery again, those crude circles he wanted to smile at himself. Was not quite able. No, honey, he said. When you were in with those two ghosts, those weren't ghosts, they were just the Budinger twins. Well, when, when you were in with them, Mr. Crandall was telling me that his wife had been having little chest pains. In fact, you might have been responsible for saving her life, or at least for keeping it from being much worse. Now it was Ellie's turn to look startled. Lewis thought, nodded. She needed a doctor, honey. I'm a doctor, but I was only there because it was your night to go trick-or-treating. Ellie considered this for a long time and then nodded. But she'll probably die anyway, she said matter-of-factly. People who have heart attacks usually die. Even if they live, pretty soon they have another one and another one and another one and until boom. And where did you learn these words of wisdom, may I ask? Ellie only shrugged. Very Lewis-like shrug. He was amused to see. She allowed him to carry in her bag of candy, an almost ultimate sign of trust. And Lewis pondered her attitude. The thought of Church's death had brought a near hysteria. The thought of grandmotherly Norma Crandall dying, that Ellie seemed to take calmly, a ma matter of course, a given. What had she said? Another one and another one until, boom. The kitchen was empty, but Lewis could hear Rachel moving around upstairs. He set Ellie's candy down on the counter and said, It doesn't necessarily work that way, Ellie. Norma's heart attack was a very small one, and so I was able to administer the treatment right away. I doubt if her heart was damaged much at all. She, oh, I know, Ellie agreed almost cheerfully, but she's old, and she'll die pretty soon anyway. Mm. Mr. Crandall, too, can I have an apple before I go to bed, Daddy? No, he said, looking at her thoughtfully. Go up and brush your teeth, babe. Does anyone really think they understand kids, he wondered. When the house was settled and they were in their side-by-side -side twin beds, Rachel asked softly, was it very bad for Ellie Lou? Was she upset? No, he thought. She knows old people croak at regular intervals just like she knows to let the grasshopper go when it spits. Grasshopper go when it spits, like she knows that if you stumble on the number 13 when you're skipping rope, your best friend will die, like she knows that you put the graves in diminishing circles up in the pet cemetery. Nope, he said. She handled herself very well. Let's go to sleep, Rachel, okay? That night as I slept in their house, and as Judd lay awakeful in his, there was another hard frost. The wind rose in the early morning, ripping most of the remaining leaves, which were now an uninteresting brown, from the trees. The wind awoke Lewis, and he started up on his elbows, mostly asleep and confused. There were, steep, there were steps on the stairs, slowly dragging steps. Pascal would come back. Only now, he thought, two months had passed. When the door opened, he would see a rotting horror, the jogging shorts caked with mold. 
the flesh fallen in great holes, the brain decayed, the paste, only the eyes would be alive, hellishly bright and alive. Pascal would not speak this time. His vocal cords would be too decayed to produce sounds, but his eyes, they would beckon him to come. No, he breathed, and the steps died out. He got up, went to the door, and pulled it open, his lips drawn back in a grimace of fear and resolution. His flesh cringing, Pascal would be there, and with his raised arms, he would look like a long, dead conductor, about to call for the first thundering phrase of Walpurgisnacht, German. No such thing as Judd might have said. The landing was empty, silent. There was no sound but the wind. Lewis went back to bed and slept. See, under chapter 20, we're under 21. Chapter 21. Let's see how long this one is. Yeah, we'll read it. Okay, there we go. Chapter 21. The next day, Lewis called the intensive care at the EMMC. Norma's condition was still listed as critical. That was standard operating procedure for the first 24 hours following a heart attack. Lewis got a cheerier assessment from Weybridge, her doctor, however. I wouldn't even call it a minor myocardial in infarction, he said. No scarring. She owes you a hell of a lot, Dr. Creed. On impulse, Lewis stopped by the hospital later that week with a bouquet of flowers and found that Norma had been moved to a semi-private room downstairs. A very good sign. Judd was with her. Norma exclaimed over the flowers and buzzed the nurse for her vase. Then she directed Judd until they were in water, arranged her specifications, and placed on the dresser in the corner. Mother's feeling ever so much better, Judd said, drying. Dryly, after he had fiddled with the flowers for the third time. Don't be smart, Judson, Norma said. No, ma'am. At last, Norma looked at Lewis, I want to thank you for what you did, she said with a shyness that was utterly unaffected and thus doubly touching. Judd says I owe you my life. Barris Lewis said, Judd exaggerates. Not very damn much, he don't, Judd said. He squinted at Lewis, almost smiling, but not quite. Did your mother tell you never to slip a thank you note? Lewis, a thank you. Lewis, Lewis, she hadn't said anything about that, at least not that Lewis could remember. But I believe she had said something once about false modesty being half the sin of pride. Norma, he said, anything I could do, I was pleased to do. You're a dear man, Norma said. You make this, you take this man of mine out somewhere and let him buy you a glass of beer. I'm feeling sleepy again. I can't seem to get rid of him. Judd stood with a with alacrity. Hot damn, I'll go for that. Lewis quick, before she changed her mind. The first snow came a week before Thanksgiving. They got another four inches on the 22nd of November. But the day before the holiday itself was clear and blue and cold, Lewis took his family to Bangor International Airport and saw them off on the first leg of their trip back to Chicago for a visit with Rachel's parents. It's not right, Rachel said, for perhaps the 20th time since discussions on this matter had commenced in earnest a month ago. I don't like thinking of you rattling around the house alone on Thanksgiving Day. That's supposed to be a family holiday, Lewis. Should have stayed home then. Lewis shifted Gage, who looked gigantic and wide-eyed in his first big boy Parker on his, to his other arm. Ellie was at one of the big windows watching an Air Force, watching an Air Force helicopter take off. I'm not exactly going to be crying in my beer, Lewis said. Judd and Norma are going to have me oh for turkey and all the trimmings. Hell, I'm the one who feels guilty. I've never liked those big holiday group groups anyway. I start drinking in front of some football game at 3 in the afternoon and fall asleep at 7. And the next day it feels like the Dallas Cowgirls are dancing around and yelling Bula Bula inside my head. I just don't like sending you off with the two kids. I'll be fine, she said, flying first class. I feel like a princess and Gage will sleep on the flight from Logan to O'Hare. You hope, he said, and they both laughed. Flight was called and Ellie scampered over. That's us, Mommy. Come on, come on, come on. They'll leave without us. No, they won't, Rachel said. She was clutching her three pink boarding cards in one hand. She was wearing her fur coat. Some fake stuff that was a luxuriant brown. Probably it was supposed to look like a muskrat, Lewis thought. Whatever it was supposed to look like, it made her look absolutely lovely. Perhaps something of what she he felt showed in his eyes because she hugged him impulsively, semi-crushing Gage between them. Gage looked surprised, but not terribly upset. Louis Creed, I love you, she said. Mommy, Ellie said now in a fever of patience. Come on. Come on. C oh, all right, she said. Be good, Louis. Tell you what, he said, grinning. I'll be careful. Say hello to your folks, Rachel. Oh, you, she said. Wrinkled her nose at him. Rachel was not fooled. 
She knew perfectly well why Lewis was skipping this trip. Funny. He watched them enter the boarding ramp and disappear from sight for the next week. He already felt homesick and lonely for them. He moved over to the window where Ellie had been hand, had Ben's hand stuffed in his coat pockets, watching the baggage handlers loading the hold. The truth was simple. Not only Mr. But also Mrs. Irwin Goldman of Lake Forest, Forest had disliked Lewis from the beginning. He came from the wrong side of the tracks, but that was just for starters. Worse, he had fully expected their daughter to support him while he went to medical school, where he would almost surely flunk out. Lewis could have handled all this, in fact, had been doing so. Then something happened which Rachel did not know about, and never would, not from Lewis anyway. Erwin Goldman had offered to pay Lewis's entire tuition through, and through med school. The price of this scholarship, Goldman's word, was that Lewis should break off his engagement with Rachel at once. Lewis Creed had not been at the optimum time of life to deal with such an outrage, but such melodramatic proposals of bribes to call a spade a spade are rarely made to those who are at an optimum time, which might be around the age of 85. He was tired, for one thing. He was spending 18 hours a week in classes, another 20 hitting the books, another 15 waiting tables in a deep-dish pizza joint down the block from the Whitehall Hotel. He was also nervous. Mr. Goldman's oddly jovial manner that evening had contrasted completely with his previous cold behavior, and Lewis thought that when Goldman invited him into the study for a scour, a look had passed from him to his wife later, much later, when time had lent a little perspective, Lewis would reflect that horses must feel much the same free-floating anxiety when they smell the first smoke of a prairie fire. He began expecting Goldman to reveal at any moment that he knew Lewis had been sleeping with his daughter. When Goldman instead made his incredible offer, even going so far as to take his checkbook from the pocket of his smoking jacket like a rake in a no old cow coward farce. Lewis had blown up. He accused Goldman of trying to keep his daughter like an ex exhibit in a museum, of having no regard for anyone but himself, and of being an overbearing, thoughtless bastard. He would be a long time it would be a long time before he would admit to himself that part of his rage had been relieved. All of these little insights into Erwin Goldman's character though perhaps true had no redeeming touch of diplomacy in them. Any semblance of no old coward departed. If there was humor in the rest of the conversation, it was much a much more vul vulgar sort. Goldman told him to get out, and that if he ever saw Lewis on his doorstep again, he would shoot him like a yellow dog. Lewis told Goldman to take his checkbook and plug up his ass with it. Goldman said he had been bu he had seen bums in the gutter were more potential than Lewis Creed. Lewis told Goldman he would also shove his goddamn Bank of America, America card and his American Express gold card right up there beside his checkbook. None of this had been a promising first step toward good relations with the future in-laws. He and Rachel brought them around after each man had had a chance to repent of the things he had said, although neither of them had ever changed his mind in the slightest about the other. There was no more melodrama, certainly no dismally theatrical from this day forward I have no daughter scene. Goldman would have probably suffered through Rachel's marriage to the creature from the Black Lagoon before denying her. Nevertheless, the face rising above the collar of Erwin Goldman's morning coat on the day Lewis married Rachel greatly resembled the faces sometimes seen carved on Egyptian sarcophagi. Their wedding present had been a six-place setting of spode china and a microwave oven. No money for most of Lewis's harem scare med school days. Rachel worked as a clerk in a woman's apparel store. From that day to this day, Rachel only knew that things had been that things had been and continued to be tense between her husband and her parents, particularly between Lewis and her father. Lewis could have gone to Chicago with his family, although the university schedule would have been would have meant flying back three days earlier than Rachel and the kids. That was not a great hardship. On the other hand, four days with Imho Tep and his wife the Sphinx would have been would have been. The children had uh, melted his in-laws a good deal, as children often do. Lewis suspected that he himself could have completed the repro comment simply by pretending he had forgotten that evening in Goldman's study. It, would even, it wouldn't even matter that Goldman knew he was pretending, but the fact was, and he at least had the guts to be up front about it with himself, that he did not quite want to make the repro comment. 
Ten years was a long time, but it was not quite long enough to take away the slimy taste that had come into his mouth when in Goldman's study over glasses of brandy the old man had opened one side of the idiotic, that idiotic smoking jacket and moved the checkbook residing within. Yes, he had felt relief that the nights, five of them in all, that he and Rachel had spent in his nearest sagging apartment bed had not been discovered, but that surprise disgust had been quite had been quite its own thing, and the years between them, then and now, had not changed it. He could have come, but not, but he preferred to send his father-in-law, the, his grandchildren, his daughter, and a, me and a message. The Delta 727 pulled away from the ramp where he turned, and he saw Ellie at one of the front windows, waving frantically. Lewis waved back, smiled, and then someone, Ellie or Rachel, hiked Gage into the window. Lewis waved, and Gage waved back, perhaps seeing him perhaps only imitating Ellie. Fly my people safe, he muttered, then zipped his coat and went out to the parking lot. Here the wind whined and zoomed with force enough to almost near his, to almost tear his hunter's cap off his head, and he clapped the hand to do it. He clapped the hand to it. He fumbled with his keys to unlock the driver's side of his car and then turned at the as the jet rose beyond the terminal building. Its nose tilted upward into the hard blue Blue, its turbos thundering, feeling very lonely indeed now, ridiculously close to tears, Lewis waved again. He was still feeling blue that evening when he crossed Route 15 after a couple of beers with Judd and Norma. Norma had a, had drunk a glass of wine, something she was allowed, even encouraged to have, by Dr. Weybridge. They had moved into the kitchen tonight in deference to the season. Judd had stoked up the small Merrick stove and they had sat around it, the, bear, the beer cold, the heat good, and Judd had talked about how the Micmac Indians had staved off a British landing at Machias 200 years ago. In those days, the Micmacs had been pretty fearsome, he said, and then added that he guessed there were a few state and federal land lawyers who thought they still were. It should have been a fine evening, but Lewis was aware of the empty house waiting for him. Crossing the lawn and feeling the frost crunching under his shoes, he heard the telephone begin to ring in the house. He broke into a run got through the front door, sprinted through the living room, knocking over a magazine stand, and then slid most of the way across the kitchen, his frosty shoes skidding over the linoleum. He, st he snared the phone. Hello? Lewis, R Rachel's voice a little distant, but absolutely fine. We are here. We've made it. No problems. Great, he said, and sat down to talk to her, thinking, I wish to God you were here. Let's end of chapter 21. We're going to stop there today. We'll get into chapter 22 in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, the notification bell. And stay tuned for the next installment of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. You have a great day. Thank you.